it, it's a great pleasure for me to be here in Canada. Um, uh, this market, this community is so important to us on lots of levels. Uh, first, from a, a circulation and audience standpoint, you, you know how important the, uh, the Canadian uh, population is in terms of the readership of both US-based US media distributed into the market, also in terms of digital audiences, but especially what I like coming up here and visiting our partners is the nimble state of this market, the fact that you operate often, I, I believe, with greater speed uh, in, in setting aside less orthodoxies or setting aside orthodoxies more easily than a lot of, lot of the large-scale publishers I find elsewhere. So um, I'm happy to be here. Um, they have me down for an hour and 15 minutes, and I haven't spent an hour and 15 minutes with my wife in the last 10 years in one city. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't have that much content. Uh, I don't bring PowerPoints home, well, maybe occasionally. Um, and so uh, we'll make this interactive as much as we can. I feel a little intimidated. We did a, a lunch in the Hearst Tower on a Monday with Oprah. Uh, it was something we do occasionally with advertisers. And, and she had the audience crying, literally, by the end of her talk. And, and I have nothing in here that's going to register that level of emotion. But um, we are optimistic about this industry and uh, its future. And as you see at the, the title slide, our corporate position is unbound, uh, which uh, signifies our belief in both the core print medium as well as everything that's to come. And uh, this is an important week for our company at the Hearst Corporation. Our longtime CEO, Frank Benick, uh, is stepping down and passing the reins to Steve Schwartz, a uh, 51-year-old new CEO of Hearst. Steve has been at the company for 20 years, was actually my partner on the launch of Smart Money, way more than 20 years ago. Uh, and a former editor turned newspaper executive and now the CEO of the parent company. And, and Frank has one of these great quotes, and that is, if you're not growing, you're falling behind. And it speaks a lot about the corporate philosophy that we have. And, and I thought I'd spend a few minutes kind of just table setting a little bit about the Hearst Corporation and then talk about the magazine company. I might wander around. This stage is small. And Oprah was kind of working the whole crowd on Monday, and uh, maybe that'll make you more emotional. So the, the parent company, founded in 1887, so there's very few private companies that are 125 years old. William Randolph Hearst, famously, his father famously won the San Francisco Examiner in a poker game and gave it to a son who dropped out of Harvard and you know, moved back to San Francisco to run the newspaper. Today, the company is still, it's owned by a trust for the benefit of the Hearst family, and so it succeeded. I guess that we're probably into the fifth generation at this point. And being a private company, um, I think especially during a period of change, gives us an enormous amount of flexibility. It really allows us to be, both be at scale, but to set our own rules in terms of how we want to grow our company. And so wandering around a little bit and talking about some of the divisions, we have 20,000 employees in the company, 12,000 are in the magazine division globally, seven major groups, magazines, newspapers, broadcasting, entertainment, syndication, our ventures group, business media, and then real estate. And, and something that's a very interesting fact about the company, and, and perhaps is relevant to many of you, is our ability to partner. More than 50% of the revenues of the Hearst Corporation comes from businesses where we have a partner. Um, and we'll give you more examples of that. And our philosophy has always been that we'd rather own um, half of a highly successful business than all of an unsuccessful one. And it allows us to navigate you know, past whatever the headline news is. The best example in the last 24 months is our launch of HGTV Magazine with our partners at Scripps. And, and so, you know, there's always lots of skepticism when you introduce a new product. Um, but when you have, a, especially, you know, given uh, some of the, the, the pressures on at least the traditional part of our business. But when um, you have a partner with Scripps who brings such promotional energy to it, uh, this great brand that we have in HGTV, and this is the the second deal we've done, the first one, of course, was Food Network. Um, you get to you know, have your own sense of timing. And, and my personal experience with that the best was actually the launch of Smart Money. Smart Money was announced, I guess it was um, late, 2000, um, late 1991. And this was going to be a fresh new magazine about stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. 30 days after we launched Smart Money, uh, we, we announced Smart Money, the venture, Iraq invaded Kuwait, so you have to go back in history. The stock market fell 22 points. People hated stocks. There were huge outflows out of mutual funds. And we were launching a magazine about stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Uh, sometimes I felt our, our sales presentation was like a Saturday Night Live script. You know? it didn't, it'd be like, 
a magazine called Subprime or something you know, today. It, it seemed totally out of sync. But uh, guess what? You know, the, we had a good partner in Dow Jones. Uh, the market uh, helped turn around. And by the time we kind of got the frequency and we had to, to really invest, smart money was flying. And, and that, to me, was kind of the most cogent example about the role of partnerships. We get a lot of inbound partnership queries at the company because we're known to be such good partners across so many different businesses. When I first got my job as president of the magazine company a few years ago, a day or two after I got my job, I received a letter. And it was, it was kind of on flimsy paper. And it was on KISS Productions was the logo. Dear David, I read of your new job. I have an idea for you. I'd like to come see you. Signed, Gene Simmons. <laughs> True story. And so it, it didn't quite look right. So I had our PR people vet it. And it turned out it was from Gene Simmons. Gene, Gene came in to see me, which, you know, if you would have told me when I was 17 years old, I'd be taking a meeting with Gene Simmons. <laughs> That'd be pretty great. Uh, Gene, of course, is not an individual. He's a media brand. And he presented a big play about all the things that, you know, that he had. And I, I, on the one hand, I thought it was actually very interesting. Uh, sub, some of the subsequent things that Vice Media has done with success, I thought, was, was part of that discussion. But I didn't feel you know, a three-day employee at the Hearst Corporation that I was going to bring Gene Simmons into the corporate boardroom <laughs> to pitch this concept. But it, it shows you, you know, when you communicate to the outside world, you're open to be a partner. And these are like your marriages, you know, uh, uh, with your own partners. You know, you have good days and bad days, but you're always thinking of the other person. And, uh, and this is a philosophy set down by Frank Benick. It's an absolute key way that our own company has grown, and I think it has relevancy to companies large and small. Our newspaper company, 15 daily newspapers, the Houston Chronicle and San Francisco Chronicle are our biggest. Um, one thing that I enjoy a great deal about my job is um, all the, uh, the people who run these businesses all sit together. Uh, we get great transparency into each other's business. A lot of great work being done on the digital side in our newspaper group. And you might have seen that last week we named the new president of the San Francisco Chronicle, Joanne Bradford, uh, accomplished digital executive who was the chief revenue officer of Demand Media. So great to see that type of talent move into the traditional business. The, um, we have 29 local TV stations. Um, and the local TV business has been a really reliable, durable business in most years. But during the US political cycle, has been an extraordinary business. And you know, for better or for worse, the extreme partisanship that exists in US politics you know, the Supreme Court liberalized campaign finance. And, and during now uh, election years when it takes a billion dollars to run for president of the United States, there's a huge amount of you know, revenue that flows into these businesses. My, my favorite example was um, Sheldon Adelson, of course, the Las Vegas casino magnate who spent over $100 million of his money to try to get his slate of candidates elected. That was largely a wealth transfer from Sheldon Adelson to the Hearst Corporation. Uh, and so there, there's no signs that the partisanship and the money behind politics, and so the local TV business has been a great business uh, for us. Our biggest business in our company is our entertainment and syndication company. And this houses our stakes in ESPN, Lifetime, A&E. Um, we just bought 50% uh, of Mark Burnett just maybe about two years ago. And, um, and I think our partnership in ESPN is a great example. We were already partners then with Cap Cities in A&E and &E in, in Lifetime, 50-50 at the time. And this goes back in a lot of initials. Uh, RJR Nabisco was acquired by KKR, and they owned 20%. RJR owned 20% of ESPN. And they were looking to sell that stake. And the people at Cap Cities said, you should sell it to Hearst and to Frank Benick. They're a good, reliable partner. And that's who we'd prefer. And then that, you know, you know, ESPN is probably the most valuable global media franchise. It was purchased for less than $200 million, that 20% stake. I can tell you that, you know, you know maybe after the, trading the beads for the long, I mean, for New York City, it's probably the second greatest uh, business transaction ever. And it's a byproduct, again, of Frank Bennett's relationship with uh, Leonard Goldenstein at Cap Cities and all that great work that was done. Our business to business media group, which is, Deeply involved, uh, certainly in terms of data in, in the automotive space and in terms of healthcare, we've done a series of acquisitions. But as part of you know, expansive thinking about what fits under media company, we own 50% now of Fitch Ratings, one of the three big global ratings agencies, you know, S&P, Moody's, and Fitch. Uh, that business had a lot of 
regulatory noise around it for a period of time after the financial crisis, but although, you know, S&P, I think, has some issues they're still dealing with, but for Fitch and Moody's, it's been a, a great success, and there's a huge amount of financing, refinancing going on on a global basis, and, and Fitch is a great example. We initially, I think we bought 10%, then up to 30, and then to 50. And it shows you our strategy for great companies. Sometimes we get to acquire them outright, sometimes we grow them, and sometimes we have, you know, long-standing private companies that are looking for a partner, and they turn to us. Our Hearst Ventures is a very interesting piece of our company. This is a group of individuals taking investments, not in startups, but kind of early stage companies. Uh, initially, it was just you know, to maximize the portfolio, but now we're starting to invest in companies that are disrupting the traditional space as well. We have 10% of BuzzFeed, which is very much in the news uh, right now. And, and earlier this year, we bought a stake in Refinery29. Are you familiar with Refinery29 here? Great disruptor in the fashion space. Fantastic business, you know. One of these examples of a business that's three or four years old and already is challenging the likes of Harper's Bazaar, Ellen Vogue. And so um, we learn a lot and we, you know, we work with these companies to help make them more successful. They work with us to provide visibility into pure play startups and how they operate. And then the magazine company, which is the, the key focus of our discussion and hopefully your questions as well. Uh, 20 businesses in the US, uh, uh, more than 300 international editions that we have, um, and 23 magazines in the UK, and I just came back from the UK. In addition to the, of course, the ink on paper business, we have our big digital media business, our brand development, our Hearst Books, CDS Global. And how many of you are, have worked with CDS in the past or work with them today? And you know, they are the absolute premier best in class provider in that space. It's one of our most important businesses we have and Malcolm is a, is a great executive in terms of running that. Interesting, during a period of so much kind of change during the, you know, it's in its ecosystem and with its clients, CDS has navigated through so much. And it's a place that we put a lot of CapEx spending. Uh, in fact, probably the, the unit gets the most CapEx, Malcolm, if you make sure that's the case. And it's a business that we see as a key part of our future, uh, not only in, in terms of serving traditional publishers, but also its own diversification efforts. And then about three years ago, we acquired iCrossing, one of the, the last big independent digital media agencies. And it's operated as a separate business, but we get a lot of learning and insight by having iCrossing in the family. So if you work in the magazine business and you go to parties on the weekends, you get a lot of comments from your friends, right, about the magazine business, you know? Uh, the enlightened ones, you know, tell you about their favorite magazines, the one they just subscribe to. The unenlightened ones, you know, hold you by the arm. Are you okay, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and people often to me uh, liken to be like a Rubik's Cube. Boy, that must be hard. And, and certainly uh, there are days that our jobs seem hard. Uh, my son last summer mastered the, the Rubik's Cube. I look at that, if you gave me, you know, 15 days, I probably couldn't do it. He could do it in about five minutes. So maybe some Rubik's Cubes are challenges to be solved. But as mentioned, you know, we think for many, of the um, issues confronting the industry, there are solutions. It requires reframing your thinking. It requires taking risks, and that's what we try to do in our company. Um, you know, one of the things that we constantly have to think about is pacing ourselves against these pure plays that start up every day coming after us. Companies that have everything to gain and nothing to lose. And we kind of, you know, in big companies historically, operate with the inverse of that. Everything to lose and nothing to gain. But you play that out in kind of vertical after vertical, and sometimes the end result isn't so good. Last night when I got in from uh, the airport, I took Uber. You guys are familiar with Uber? Classic disruptor in this space. Um, I, I was recently talking to a friend that is doing a renovation of his home, and he was talking about Houzz, H-O-U-Z-Z. -Z. Are you familiar with Houzz? 1.5 million images, brilliantly searched and so easily. You know, classic disruptor in that vertical. And so these are the things we think about. And if we want to harness that energy, it gives us the confidence to be unbound, to think about maximizing the current business, but also to plan for the future. But there's a couple things we have to do in order to be successful at that. And as I've been kind of talking about, making scale work to our advantage. About two years ago, there was an article in the New York Times talking about um, war games that were happening in the Persian Gulf. If I remember the statistics right, 
There are 22 aircraft carriers in the world by all the nations. 12 belong to the United States. Five of those 12 are permanently stationed in the Persian Gulf to deal with local tensions and to ensure you know, oil distribution. And so given the off and on you know, simmering relationships with Iran, they did war games to see if sets of speedboats working in a coordinated fashion could take down aircraft carriers. And the answer through the war games was yes. And I thought it was just a great metaphor for how we think about our business. And if historically, you know, we're thinking about our strategy versus other big company A, B, or C, it's actually the wrong approach. And what we have to focus on and we have to partner and mimic are the speedboats that come after us every day. Now, we have this great investment in Refinery29, a breakout star. We only talk about the ones that, that win. We don't talk about refineries 1 through 28 that might have blown up and <laughs> lost their money and their parents' money and their neighbors' money. But it's a, it's a way of thinking in terms of where we draw inspiration, how we benchmark ourselves. And it's been a shift that, you know, in the past, well, it's us versus Connie Nast or Time Warner or News Corp. But that's not the right way to plan for the future. The other thing that we think a great deal about, and this is largely informed by some of the pure plays in digital, is embracing um, both the modestly stated eternal truths uh, and as well as month to moment. And I'll start with kind of month to moment. And I think this is a big opportunity for all publishers. So uh, we are really successful with our magazines in being relevant on kind of a, we'll call it a gross monthly basis, right? You know, our summer issues, the July issues come out, you know, in the beginning of June, and they're kind of seasonally right. But there's a lot of consumer behavior where people move surprisingly in unison that we're not focused on, I don't think, sufficiently as magazine publishers. And so our January issues inevitably have the new year, new you message, right? Perhaps here as well, because they're January. That's the new year, new you. The problem is they come out like December 6th when people are not quite in the new year, new you uh, uh, mindset. 27% of the US population goes on a diet on January 1st. But we don't have any diet product that shows up on January 1st. It's embedded in our content that shows up on December 6th. It's too early, okay? It's like Moses coming down from the mountaintops with the tablets, you know, just a little too soon. And the ability for our brands is to think about being relevant every season, every month, every week, every day. And what's great about it is, you know, in all markets, you can lay out a calendar, right? And you can note the national holidays, the things that take place every single year that people organize their days, organize their lives around. So Father's Day in the US is coming up in two weeks, right? We don't have any specific Father's Day product, okay? Something that shows up the Thursday before Father's Day, when people are actually thinking about it. Um, in the US, Halloween is the second biggest consumer spend after Christmas. But other than um, the new people who buy our single copies on the newsstand of our Halloween-themed issues, we have no share of wallet okay, of the second biggest consumer activity. And you can actually you know, look at it in pace when the consumer activity takes off. And at the same time, you can think about within the day. So if you use Google Search as a way to inform you, um, between 2 and 4 p.m., among the most searched terms is, what should I make for dinner? Okay? We need a product between 2 and 4 p.m. That's what I should make for dinner. Uh, and uh, another interesting example is uh, I, I saw an executive who owns a company called A Place for Mom. And it is a lead generation business for assisted living. And while people kind of age continually through the year, of course, right? Um, that something like 40% of their business is written in the first five or six weeks of the year. And he explained what happens is, you know, children come home from the holidays, children, 50-year-old people, right, you know, and they see that mom and dad maybe need some help. The kids make a decision together, and then this year starts, and they start to put that in action. And so they have a business that you would think would not have seasonality, but, has, but clearly does. Big opportunity for us to think about for, uh, for uh, our uh, company of what sort of product do we serve up when this is what people are thinking about. And so month to moment, 
And so we're challenging our editors and our publishers not only to be relevant on a monthly basis, but to be on a seasonal, a monthly, a weekly, and a daily, and then a day part. And so it's a real kind of change of thinking for us. But we think if we don't do it, someone else will step in front of us. Someone else will have the what should I make for dinner 2 to 4 p.m. product. Guilt Group with their flash sales owns 12 noon for a lot of young women around the world. And so we have to be thinking along these lines. I, I had lunch a few months ago with Jonah Peretti, the founder of BuzzFeed. How many of you are on BuzzFeed on a regular basis? So it, it, it's an interesting product. And I don't fully understand it. It's a mix of crazy you know, photos and it's news piece. And I asked Jonah, A, I admit it, I don't really understand his product, but I said, you know, who's, his, who's your audience and where are they when they consume it? And, and he said something that I thought had a lot of insight in terms of who he was serving. He said, they serve the bored at work community. Knowledge workers at their desk, right? You know, stuck in all the stuff that I send to Malcolm and he sends to all his <laughs> in the organization to get done. And um, this is the way they take a break. I thought it was very interesting, the board at work community. So people, the entrepreneurs, are thinking about that. Let's talk about the eternal truths. So in addition to kind of breaking the year down into component parts and looking to try to have a relevant strategy for each one, there are some macro forces that inherently connect all of our businesses. People want to look younger. People like to lose weight. People want to live in a beautiful home that reflects their personality. People want to get more sleep. Uh, you, got, you guys all acknowledge, among working moms, okay, um, uh, sleep deprivation comes up very high on the list of any piece of research, because they have to do two jobs, because their husbands <coughs> fall asleep at 10 p.m. on the sofa with a can of beer in their hand, okay? Uh, and it's interesting that you hear the stories that, you know, at places like QVC and HSN, the amount of sales that are done between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. Or we know this through our 29 local TV stations that one of the biggest growth areas in terms of both programming at the local level as well as audience development is the 4.30 a.m. local newscast. People don't sleep. So there's a big opportunity. You know, think about the things that in a company of ours, 30 million circulation, 80 million readers, that give us a chance to connect these eternal truths. And, and we had the best example of this with a product I was very proud of um, that we're, we've launched and we're still building called Seven Years Younger. So we were thinking about anti-aging is very interesting, right? Um, anti-aging products are used by women in their 20s to older boomers. There's a lot of R&D spent at the manufacturer level because um, there's a lot of profit in the serums and the creams. But so we thought, could we come up with an anti-aging magazine? And it felt like cough syrup, right? You know, we couldn't come up with the right tone. But we have, you know, many of our magazines have audiences that are totally both interested in the concept but relevant to marketers. So we created a new editorial brand called Seven Years Younger. And we did research, and that indicated, it, it, the research indicated is that that's the age that people would like to look, you know, through product, diet, and exercise. Ten years doesn't seem realistic. Five years seems like yesterday. Seven years younger. This is what we're trying to get the market to dance to. And what we did, something we've never done before, is we created editorial sections using the seven years younger. We put that in five Hearst magazines that runs every month to have our, the natural credibility of these environments to build this new editorial brand. We published a book uh, that when it debuted was number three on the New York Times bestseller list in terms of the how-to section. We're building a digital business. We're talking about a whole set of uh, special content plays. And it was important to us for, uh, you know, and, and, and if you've done this better than, than we have, boy, we have a, a lot to talk about. And, um, but that we try to flex all the muscles in the organization. And there's so many things that you can learn by watching, for example, the way television does it. And, you know, in, um, before there's a, someone's a, you know, a guest host on Saturday Night Live, you'll find them on the Today Show on Wednesday morning, Jimmy Fallon on Thursday night. You know, NBC, you watch the way they take a single person, they pull it all the way through the promotional machine. And we've kept our businesses way too siloed, you know, for reasons that only make, self, only make sense to ourselves. Stephen Burke, who's the CEO of Comcast, you know, and NBC, um, refers to this as symphony marketing. Every unit kind of plays their own role, has their own instrument to play 
as they create this music. And there's a lot of good application for us. But if we do this right, and I tried to limit this just to 12, there's a lot of great things happening in the business. And I apologize, some of these are perhaps more relevant to a large scale international publisher like Hearst, but hopefully there's some good lessons regardless of the size of your companies. As I mentioned, we believe in growth. Our company has doubled in size in the last two years. Um, the biggest step in this was our acquisition of the Log Adair properties two years ago, June 1st. So we were 24 months into that, where we acquired 100 publications from Log Adair, uh, 5,000 employees in 14 countries around the world, and brought us into partnership, direct partnership with Transcontinental Media, which we're thrilled to, to be here for L in the editions that we have, the two editions of L, but also through launches and spin-offs. Um, and so this has really changed our company in terms of its scale. And I mentioned the diversification of our parent company in the different units, but this is just looking at the magazine company that I work in. Now roughly 40% of our revenues are US media, print and digital, 40% international, and 20% um, from services, both CDS Global as well as uh, iCrossing. And the international piece is interesting to see what's kind of playing out. In the last year, we've launched a dozen international editions. We have announced Esquire in Vietnam. Two years ago, we announced, I don't know which issue of Cosmo is that? Uh, that must be from Thailand. We announced um, Cosmopolitan two years ago did, um, it has a monthly edition of Mongolia, true story. Uh, it almost seemed like a punchline to a joke. And in fact, Stephen Colbert did a whole send up in terms of his image of what Cosmo Mongolia would be like. Uh, I encourage you to find it, it's a, it's a real hoot. Uh, uh, last week we announced Harper's Bazaar in Germany, in France. And so we get to see the continued opportunity to go around the world. Uh, in some cases, these are markets that are developed markets that we think there's room. In other cases, especially when you look at Asia, you know, as you know better than I do, you know, millions and millions of people pouring into the middle class uh, magazines by their natural kind of their aspirational vehicles where people kind of informs their aesthetic their taste level the things they dream about and so we're finding very strong growing businesses uh, throughout all of our Asian businesses our um, Western European businesses are under some stress because the headline news there that there's no getting around 25 percent youth employment in Spain as a business you know has it uh, so, so some of our businesses a bit are are you know facing kind of tougher headwinds and, and other parts of our business continue to grow but we're very focused on the international business. But I mentioned our belief in um, creating new product regardless of what the pundits might say. And these are two interesting examples. And also speak to, you know, you can introduce product, especially when you have two big companies going at it. And so uh, Food Network Magazine 2009, the meteor kind of hit the earth, right? You know, we're all gonna be living in caves before you know it. And, and, and so very tough time for the business. And so we, this is the Royal Week, because I wasn't the company then, decided to test Food Network magazine. And so four years later, 1.6 million circulation, number one magazine on the newsstand in its sector, 500,000 copies a month, number one in terms of advertising. So a, pro, a new product that totally took over a nine book field. An HGTV magazine, just over a year, and a million paid circulation, and a big hit. Could we have done this without these brands? You know, these are good magazines, but the brands were very important to us. The, the strength and the weight provided by our partner. But it shows you that regardless of, you know, what's going on, there's always a white space opportunity. And I'm always reminded, and you've heard this old saying before, that in um, 1895, the head of the patent office suggested they close the patent office because they believed that anything that could possibly be invented had been invented by that time. It's always natural to think there's no more room for anything, right? But yet, there's always new cars, new watches, new everything, hotels that are launched. Um, and I think, though, there's, a, there's another piece to this, which is an important element. And I think this is something the industry has struggled with. And that is, um, the industry, except under huge financial stress, is actually loath to close product. You know? um, and I think that's actually it's a bad thing. I think that, you know, certainly for the large-scale publishers that have multi-title portfolios, that some of the brands have kind of, you know, they've served out their, their life. They're done. And I think that we um, overthink the closures. And I think if we think across the overall industry, there's too much energy, and I would say too much capital, 
sometimes being devoted to trying to resuscitate businesses that we should just put down and to create something new in their place. So we believe this here. We believe in terms of creating new product. But I think if we look at the art, a lot of large-scale publishers, that the amount of time sometimes spent for the 19th iteration of trying to fix a business. Now, not that you don't try, but sometimes you've tried so much. It's such a drain on the organization. If you put that towards new product, these magazines have totally energized our company. Now, these, uh, one more comment about the way we launched these, and this goes back to the way we launched Smart Money way back when, is we only commit to two test issues. That's all we're doing. And so we put four or five million dollars in. We do it with a partner, so it's a couple million dollars for each company. You know, not so much in terms of you think about R&D. Um, and we read the results from two test issues. Newsstand sell through, insert card response, we do direct mail. How do advertisers feel about it? And only once we look at that and we see that we commit to the next stage, which is more expensive. And so, um, uh, and I want to keep doing that. So I, I will do a new product every two years. I'll commit a few million dollars, and you know, they will not all 100% be a success. But it gives us a chance to look at the true dynamic before we have to then pony up a lot of money, uh, which we've done. I, I kind of mentioned the device races. And um, uh, I, I think one of the great things that's happening for our business is this kind of device war among Barnes and Noble and Amazon with Kindle and Apple. Uh, and Samsung in terms of bringing out devices that have more features at a lower cost to consumers. And people use these. They do many things on these devices, of course, but they use them as vehicles to buy content. And one of the, the great legacies of Steve Jobs, when you think of the original iTunes store, is he taught people how to pay for digital content. Before that, it was easier to steal music than to buy it legitimately so. And so now this is ingrained and natural. So we have, you know, several million dollars every single month of digital subscription revenue that I never thought was mathematically possible. And it's because they've done a great job. And you know, these are some of the devices that have the fastest penetration of any consumer device in the history uh, of, of, uh, of the sector. And it's great to kind of see what's happening. So we have a million paid circulation in the US. Cosmopolitan's our biggest business at 180,000 per month. And Cosmos had you know, some challenges on the newsstand, so I can tell you that as the, all, a lot of the big scale publishers have had challenges on the newsstand, to be able to add 180,000 really profitable digital subscription units at the same time has been fantastic for the actual business itself. And so the only kind of negative about the traditional business is just how much kind of noise there is in the renewal process. You know it well. Uh, and how much effort you have to go to to retain your consumers. And you have people who are otherwise well-intentioned, right? They love Esquire. You send them four direct mail pieces. They put it off to the side because they're going to get to it this Saturday. And then life gets in the way, and they, never, they just fall out of your world, even though they had every desire to stay with you. And so what we like about these devices is you know, the entire effort the consumer has to put out for the renewal is they have to touch the little button, OK? And taking all the friction out of it. And, um, and that's a very important piece of it. And so not only are we happy with the revenue, not only are we very pleased with the overall engagement, time spent, you know, pages viewed, all of that is very good. But we love the fact that we're looking at conversion rates north of 70% for these, so with no cost. So you know, is this, there's a market that's developing, that people who prefer to get their magazine media content on a tablet and pay for it. The faster that market grows, the better it is for all publishers in the ecosystem. Now of note, We've had a strategy that's been counter to others in that we have not gone down the authentication route, as other publishers have. We wanted to train people from day one to pay for digital content. This is a premium experience. It's mobile. It has extra editorial bonus features. Others went down the path of offering tablet access for free to their print subscribers. And if you think of one of the great things, if we can go back in time and, you know, like Michael J. Fox, you know, and Back to the Future and flip the switch, would be, you know, to not have allowed people to get our web content for free. I don't think we're going to be able to regate that. The New York Times and newspapers, I think, have a different play than, than consumer magazines. So I wanted to establish right from day one that people pay for this content. Uh, in the same way that when Rupert Murdoch bought Dow Jones, and the big thought at the time was he would ungate WSJ.com. And he, as soon as he, after he bought it, he realized that value of those highly annuitized revenue streams to consumers. Now, the cable business is the most profitable 
media form on the planet because those consumer revenues are so stable. Uh, and so the more we can make our magazine business like the cable business, the better off we are. As we think about, though, new products, we think about um, taking risks. And we think about especially how do we get these out in the world. And I wanted to show you uh, something that's an interesting example. One of the, the thoughts we had, the ability to create new product, um, and, uh, was for Cosmo and to create a, a product called Cosmo for Guys. Okay? And this was that, you know, I read all of our magazines on the train commuting back and forth to my home in Westchester County, New York. So I read Cosmo very comfortably in a public setting. But I'm like the only person, only guy my age who I think who does that. But we thought that, especially for among young men in their 20s, there was an appetite for Cosmopolitan. It's not uncommon for women to read men's magazines to eavesdrop on what men are thinking and vice versa. So we thought, okay, this platform allows us to create new product relatively inexpensively, see what the take rate is, and also to market in a clever way. I, I think the next one shows the fun we can have in terms of as we do that. So you see tons of fun. Uh, and uh, decoder bedroom sounds. You really made full use of all of the, the ability of the technology. Uh, the product didn't work, though. And so at the same time, this concept of failing fast is important. And the reason it didn't work, I think, was simple. And that is that um, Apple didn't, you know, the promotion in the storefront is very important to drive a product. And, and the, I think the content, Apple just didn't want to get behind <laughs> to, to you know, it's a very conservative company and sometimes the content. I think we were right up to the line and maybe past the line in some cases. And so we lacked the, the promotional support from the storefronts, which didn't enable the business to scale. So we killed it after seven or eight months. You know, I might have, we might have spent $300,000 on it all in, launch, promotion. So it shows you that you, know, you can do different things uh, to take your brands into this new space. We were not gonna talk much about mobile. You're gonna talk so much about it, but um, it's obviously, you know, we'll take this as a positive that everyone carries a little computer with them that happens to make phone calls that they can access content, you know, 24 hours a day. I have four children, four teenagers. My 15-year-olds, I love when I get their Verizon bill and how much data they use and they send a thousand texts and they, they make like eight minutes of phone calls in a month, okay? In fact, if I didn't have a voice plan, they'd be very happy. And it shows you these are addictive Pavlovian devices. You've seen all the research, especially among young people. And while we can debate the pros and cons of it as a society, in terms of the ability also to create new product and relevancy is paramount. We, we talked a lot about entrepreneurs. We, we try to find these companies early on, and we reach out to strike partnerships. And this, this is, uh, Pinterest is a great example. Harper's Bazaar is the number one, brand, I believe, brand, but certainly media brand on Pinterest. I think more than 4 million pinners. Um, we went out very early, reached out to them. We put a great program in place. They did some great cross promotion. And, and this is now a very important source of referrals for Harper's Bazaar. Um, same thing with Flipboard. You know. So we, we're kind of always kind of scouting who's starting to break out in the space and how we can work with them. We, we see these as, as truly accretive to our business. I know there's a lot of discussion around Flipboard in terms of friend or foe. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll opt for friend in all these ways and to find pathways back to help grow our business. I think one of the interesting things about the magazine business is these are brands with billion dollar footprints.
but relatively small underlying media businesses. This came uh, true to me most clearly when I graduated from college and I moved to New York and I went for an interview at Esquire magazine when it was then independently owned. And I thought there had to be like an Esquire office building filled with hundreds of people who, who produced Esquire magazine with their name on the top and so on. And you get there and it's half of a floor, you know? And these are the most famous kind of modest sized businesses in the world. There's a ball bearing factory in East Toronto that's bigger than a lot of our businesses that we operate at the Hearst Corporation. And so there's big opportunities to create that value. We have all this value, this awareness. And so the Esquire Network, our partnership with NBC, which launches in September, is a good example of that. And NBC had a, um, a channel called G4, targeting young men. They wanted to upscale it. They wanted to, you know, to rebrand it. We started having discussions. We threw out, why don't you just call it the Esquire Channel? They did research, and they found out that it communicated all the right values right from day one. And NBC could have picked a name off the shelf and spent years, you know, like Spike TV trying to add value, or they could take Esquire and that 80 years of history and start on day one. This is a fun clip that got us very excited. You have uh, Knife Fight. Yep. Which is an awesome new cooking show. Which is on Esquire Network, which is going to run Jimmy Fallon's show. That's right. We're, re yeah, we're replaying on the Esquire Network. I'm so excited. I love that. Yeah, we're on the same network. I, I love this. So that's kind of a fun way to now it's a new business. And coming back to the Stephen Burke philosophy of symphony marketing, new thing from NBC Universal, the Esquire Network. Let's put Jimmy Fallon reruns on. And let's put Drew Barrymore, who's going to be producing one of the shows, put her on Jimmy Fallon to talk about it. Perfect, right? And, and, and so we're very excited about this. You know, this is kind of unique because they had a they had a highly distributed network they wanted to change. But we'll do a deal like this any day of the week. It's just fantastic for us. Commercializing content. I'll zip through the last couple. Um, you know, I think in the past we, you know, were you know all of our editors, people, and you in the room, you know, spent so much effort, uh, you know, selecting product, photographing it, presenting it beautifully. Um, and then someone else gets all the economic value when they buy it. And you feature these in your pages because you want people to be inspired by your vision and take them home. And, and so, I don't know, we had crazy rules about was it appropriate to profit from that, if you will. And that's just one of these orthodoxies that makes no sense in the modern age. Shop Bazaar is probably our most aggressive example. You'll find in every issue of Harper's Bazaar, uh, you know, several dozen little bees, stylized bees next to the editorial content, which indicates you can go to Shop Bazaar and you can buy. Uh, They've had transactions of up to $20,000, uh, which is amazing in terms of what people will pay for, sight unseen in terms of merchandise today. And so this is still kind of an R&D effort. We're still trying to figure out how to scale it, but we can't be afraid to commercialize it. I know others have are gotten, they're well ahead of us, but we have a lot more room to grow. The emerging generation of talent. You know, what's great about the kids, I think, coming out of school today is some of, so many of them are obviously digital natives. They can't remember life without a smartphone, but they love magazines. And so we always have to work so hard to flatten the hierarchies in our company and to give them a seat at the table with those natural instincts. And I'm very excited when I meet these young kids, and not only in terms of, you know, they grew up in a world different than I did, but they just love our brands. And so maybe in the past we had the steep climb up to where you had influence. You know, you had to be at the, a magazine for 10 years before you got to articulate ideas. We have to make that much faster, and that mimics the pure plays. And then lastly, in terms of um, for a new product, um, and we mentioned Esquire Television, but we're focused on a lot of our businesses in terms of how we do spin-offs, and could those be future uh, new products as well. Mary Claire has this great Mary Claire at Work product we've done um, uh, for Food Network, a cooking with kids supplement. Our best example is Cosmopolitan for Latinas. Um, this is now four times a year, started as one. Maybe they'll go to six. This is tar targeting, of course, the Hispanic population. Huge advertiser demand to reach that group. Um, and so even in the US now, we'll have two editions of Cosmopolitan on the newsstand in many cases. And, uh, and I think that's a good example of what we need to do more of. And maybe this will be a monthly product at some point. So in, in closing, I, I think my thing that I get most optimistic about our business is when you think about the story of Helen Gurley Brown. So Helen, of course, in the 60s wrote Sex and the Single Girl. She was a cultural phenomenon, you know, well-timed against the 
sexual revolution that was taking place. She had a magazine concept that she brought to Hearst. And, um, uh, and so as opposed to take her concept as it was, the very smart then president of the magazine company said, that's a great idea and we love you and we love your visibility. We have this magazine co called Cosmopolitan. Have any of you ever seen the historical editions of Cosmo? It was a quiet women's literary magazine, okay? It has nothing in common with the current Cosmo. But it, it kind of was a, it was a brand that existed. And they made the incredibly bold decision to say, let's take this magazine and totally reinvent it, okay? And make your vision and put this under the Cosmopolitan name. And it was an instant sensation. And so, you know, hugely profitable. The company Hearst was very small at the time. They started licensing Cosmo around the world. The profits from Cosmo allowed us to make investments in cable, which have been profitable and allowed us to make the acquisition of Lagadere and so on. And so the ultimate example was can an individual change the shape of an industry, a company, and a culture? And if you think of what Helen did, you know, our company would not be in its shiny glass office tower if Helen Gurley Brown had not, had not walked through that door and the company was not bold enough to make a tough decision. So I think about that all the time in terms of the things that are presented to us, you know, and to make sure that we're open to things that might seem crazy uh, initially, but could absolutely, you know, alter the shape and curve of the organization for years following. And hopefully you as executives and content produ uh, producers, think about that story of Helen Brown, you know, it's the Olympian example, but to realize the power of an individual to shape the business, I think remains in place forever. Thank you for having me.